Today's case explores one of the few wrongfully convicted felons who was thrown back in prison after being exonerated. But how does an innocent man who became a national symbol for justice later become a villain in the eyes of the law? Well, you are about to find out. As always, welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and this is the case of Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery was born in 1962 to parents Dolores and Alan Avery in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. He is the first of four children and together with his siblings Barb, Earl and Chuck, he spent most of his childhood working on the family salvage yard. According to his mother, Avery wasn't the brightest kid growing up and was even admitted to a school for slower kids. With an IQ of 70, Avery didn't have the best grades and was almost always ranked at the bottom of his class. That aside, he had a pretty normal childhood and lived through his teenage years without incident. That was until he reached 18 and started getting into trouble, reportedly because he hung out with the wrong crowd. At 18, Avery robbed a local bar with his friend and was subsequently arrested. He was convicted of the crime and sentenced to two years in the Manitowoc County Jail. But after serving 10 months out of his sentence, he was granted parole and released on probation. After his release, Avery seemingly kept his head on straight for the next year or so, during which time he met and married his wife Lori in July of 1982. Later that year, Avery would be sent back to jail for yet another crime, and this time it involved animal cruelty. Avery had allegedly suggested to two of his friends that they should throw his cat into a bonfire after he had poured gas and oil on it. He would later blame the crime on being young and stupid, which doesn't hold much water because he was an adult at the time and married. Between 82 and 85, Avery would have four children of his own with his wife Lori, named Jenny, Rachel, and twins Will and Stephen. But it would turn out that not even fatherhood could keep Avery out of trouble, and he was back in the crosshairs of the law yet again in no time. In January of 1985, Avery would run his cousin's car off the road, and when she arrived at the scene to question him about it, he pulled a gun on her. Apparently he was upset that she had been spreading false rumors about him masturbating on the front lawn, which he insisted were not true at all. At the time, said cousin was the wife of a sheriff's deputy, and this incident was allegedly the start of the bad blood between the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department and Avery. He was arrested after his cousin reported the incident to her husband, after which Avery categorically stated that the gun wasn't loaded as he was only trying to scare her out of spreading rumors about him. The courts didn't agree with him and he was convicted and sentenced to six years in prison for possession of a firearm and endangering safety while evidencing a depraved mind. But a six year sentence for wielding a firearm wasn't the worst thing that would happen to Avery that year, as his troubles were only starting. In July of 1985, only a few months after his gun debacle with his cousin, Avery would soon find himself in a brush with the law, but this time for a much more serious offense. Penny Bernstein, a woman in her late 20s at the time, was viciously attacked and taken sexual advantage of while on a run along a beach on Lake Michigan. The crime was reported and the police picked up a group of men fitting the attacker's description to be identified by Bernstein. When the time came, Penny Bernstein picked Avery out of a photo lineup and then again from a live one. The case was taken to court where Avery and his attorney presented an alibi, time stamped receipts and more than 15 eyewitnesses placing them 40 miles away at the time of the attack. These pieces of evidence were strangely not enough to acquit him of the crime, with only concrete evidence being the testimony of a state forensic official who claimed hair found on the victim was consistent with Avery's. In the end, Avery was found guilty and sentenced to 32 years in prison for sexual crimes and attempted murder. This new sentence, added to his previous six year sentence for possession of a firearm, gave him 38 years to spend behind bars. Avery maintained his innocence throughout the trial and while serving his sentence, all the while appealing the case to be retried but to no avail. Avery's attorney appealed his case after two years in 1987 and again after 11 years in 1996. Sadly, both appeals were denied. 
There's no doubt that Stephen Avery was a troubled man, but no one deserves a conviction for a crime they didn't commit, especially a man and a father of four who had never committed a crime in which hurting people was involved. Ten years after Avery's attempted murder conviction, a detective at the Brown County Police Department called the Manitowoc County Jail claiming they had an inmate, Gregory Allen, a known sex offender who confessed to taking advantage of a woman ten years ago in Manitowoc and that someone else was in jail for it. The call was transferred to Manitowoc County detectives who called Brown PD, telling them, we already have the right guy. Don't concern yourself with it. The claims were never investigated by Manitowoc Sheriff's Department, and Avery remained in prison. In 2001, the Wisconsin Innocent Project took up Avery's case and opened an investigation into his case, and soon enough found the link to Gregory Allen. In 2003, using DNA testing, they were able to link pubic hair found in the victim to be a match to Gregory Allen, who was in prison serving time for a different sexual crime charge. All charges against Avery were dropped, and he was released in September of 2003 after serving a massive 18 years in prison. The Manitowoc Police Department argued that Avery had a striking resemblance to Gregory Allen, and that Allen was under police surveillance at the time for a different sexual crime charge, which is why he was never a suspect and not brought in for the lineup. They also added that back in 1985, DNA testing technology was not available, hence the mismatch of the hair. By the time Avery was released, he was estranged from his family. His wife had divorced him, and his life was basically not his own. He went on to file a $36 million civil suit against Manitowoc County, the former district attorney and the former sheriff. The suit was for damages and defamation as a result of the wrongful conviction. The wrongful conviction of Stephen Avery sparked widespread interest and aroused national interest. Representative Mark Gundrum of the Wisconsin Assembly set up a committee to recommend amendments and improvements to the criminal justice system. The committee submitted its recommendations aimed at reducing the chances of wrongful convictions in the future. These recommendations by the committee were drafted into the legislature and were known as the Avery Bill. It was passed into law in October of 2005. The bill would later be renamed the Reform Bill after Avery was charged with murder only a month later. Things were seemingly going well for Avery. He was the face of the Innocence Project, and his case was being used as a precedence for wrongful convictions all over the country. That was, of course, until he was charged with murder in 2005. Teresa Hallback, a local photographer, had disappeared on the 31st of October 2005, the same day she had an appointment with Avery. Teresa had a meeting with Avery to photograph his minivan which he intended to sell online at autotrader.com. According to Avery, he met with Teresa at Avery's salvage yard, where she took pictures and left. Teresa was declared missing three days later after a missing person report was filed at the Sheriff's Department. An investigation ensued and Avery was arrested as the last person she had a meeting with. But he wasn't charged until her car was discovered partially covered in his salvage yard. Bloodstains found inside the vehicle matched Avery's DNA, and fragments of burnt bones were found behind his salvage yard. Avery was charged with kidnapping, sexual crimes, murder, and mutilation of a corpse on the 12th of November 2005. Avery claimed that the murder charge was a setup meant to discredit his civil suit against Manitowoc County and the Sheriff's Department. In response to Avery's claims, Manitowoc claimed it handed the investigation over to neighboring Calumet County Sheriff's Department due to a conflict of interest with Avery's previous wrongful conviction. Avery's attorney disputed every aspect of the case, from the drops of blood found in the vehicle to the Sheriff's Department's involvement. The attorneys pointed out that although Calumet County was in charge of the investigation and search of Avery's salvage yard, Manitowoc deputies were involved in the search and coincidentally, a Manitowoc deputy found the keys to Teresa's car in Avery's bedroom as well as the blood stain in her car. The attorneys claimed that conflict of interest and evidence tampering was suspected during the investigation. They also found that a vial of Avery's blood collected during his appeals in 1996 
had a puncture hole consistent with a needle. They speculate that the blood found in the victim's car could have been taken from the vial and planted to frame and incriminate Avery. This particular claim was kicked out when FBI analysis compared both blood samples and didn't find EDTA chemicals that were used to preserve the vial of blood in those found at the crime scene. Avery was the only convict exonerated by the Innocence Project who was later to be charged with a violent crime almost immediately after his release. By March of 2006, Avery wasn't the only one charged with Teresa's murder. His 16-year-old nephew, Brendan Daisy, was charged with being an accessory to murder. Daisy was charged after he confessed to helping his uncle kill and dispose of Teresa's body. He would later recant his confession, claiming that he was coerced during the interrogation and refused to testify to any involvement at his uncle's trial. He would later confess again during his trial and was found guilty of rape, murder, and mutilation of a corpse. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole until 2048. Avery was tried in Calumet County, but with a Manitowoc County judge presiding over the case. On March 18, 2007, Avery was found guilty of possession of a firearm and first degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison with no hope of parole. He was remanded to the Wisconsin Secure Program Facility, after which he was transferred to Whippan Correctional Institution in Whippan. Avery filed a motion at the State Appeals Court in 2011 for his case to be retried, but it was denied. Another appeal in 2013 to the Wisconsin Supreme Court to have the rulings of the case reviewed were also denied. Avery's case came back to the limelight in 2016 when Chicago attorney Kathleen Zellner, in conjunction with the Midwest Innocence Project, took up his case. Zellner filed an appeal to the Supreme Court citing numerous grounds of violation of Avery's constitutional rights to due process and the Manitowoc deputy's participation in the investigation, which was a clear violation of the conflict of interest waiver. The case was taking a new shape with Zellner's involvement, bringing to light due process violations and breach of the Constitution, which was either overlooked in the original trial or simply covered up. During this time, the critically acclaimed series Making a Murderer was released with shocking revelations and insights into Avery's first wrongful conviction and the trials of his second conviction. The documentary series was filmed over 10 years by filmmakers who had traveled between New York and Wisconsin over that time to interview key persons involved in Avery's case. The documentary showed what Avery's attorneys had been speculating for years. It proved that the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department was not as unbiased or innocent as they claimed. The documentary showed a testimony from Richard Mailer, who was a juror at Avery's trial but recused himself due to a family emergency. Mailer stated that while he was still in the jury pool, the common consensus was that Avery was not guilty, but he was surprised to find out later that they had reached a guilty verdict soon after he was gone. Another juror who chose to stay anonymous allegedly told the filmmakers that he felt intimidated into supporting a guilty verdict to the point that he feared for his safety. The documentary also revealed that the jury pool was not as clean as it seemed, with two members of the jury being related to the deputies of the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department. Avery's attorney Zellner filed a new motion citing ineffective counsel and expert testimony alleging that the way the victim was killed was irregular throughout the case and doesn't match the manner at which the lying fragments were discovered. The motion was summarily denied even without a panel holding a hearing on it. Avery's case finally had its day in the sun in 2019 when the Wisconsin Court of Appeals finally granted his petition asking that the case be taken back to trial for the courts to sit with new evidence. Zellner proposed that the line fragments of the victim be re-examined using modern day technology, which was not available back in 2006 when the case was originally tried. Avery's attorney also found out that the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department had given the bone fragments to the victim's family, which was odd as those bones were considered evidence and should have remained in police custody. With this in mind, Zellner filed another motion stating that the transfer of the bones to the victim's family was not only unconstitutional, but also raised red flags about the Sheriff Department's dealings with the case. 
Speaking to the media, Zellner said, it's a very sneaky way to get evidence destroyed. It seems very deliberate that the thinking was, we need to get rid of those bones, but we can't just go and cremate them ourselves. The motion was supported by ledger accounts that showed that the sheriff's department did not disclose the presence of the bones to Avery's defense during the original trial. Avery's case, along with his nephew's case, Brendan Desi, remain in court to this day with his attorneys still finding holes in the original court proceedings, especially from the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department. However, the outcome remains the same, and the future still looks bleak for Avery. Do you think Avery is guilty as charged, or do you suspect foul play from the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department? Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Stephen Avery, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.